for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Reni Christopher. Professor Reni Christopher is a professor of English who is currently Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Washington State University, Vancouver. She earned her PhD in American Literature from the University of California at Santa Cruz. Her scholarly book, The Vietnam War, The American War, Images and Representations in Euro-American and Vietnamese Exile Narratives was named Outstanding Book on Human Rights by the Gustavus Myers Center for the Study of Human Rights in North America. Her memoir, A Carpenter's Daughter, A Working Class Woman in Higher Education, addresses her experiences as the first in her family to attend college. I'm currently reading this book, and it's, it's absolutely amazing. So if you haven't read it, you should. It's, it's brilliant. Um, her poetry has appeared in several journals and collections. My name is Medea, won the New Spirit Press Chapbook Award in 1996. Longing Fervently for, Re for Revolution, won the Slipstream Press Chapbook Competition in 1998. Vietnam and California. A full-length edition um, was published by Vietnam Generation and Burning Cities Press in 1998, and it is available. There are copies available at the, at the back desk. Professor Christopher is presently working on another novel, literary fiction, with a historical setting. Today, Professor Christopher will talk about crossing boundaries, crossing genres, using history, family history, and historical research to tell uncommonly told stories. The theme of her presentation is mixing. Mixing genres, memoir, academic writing, prose and poetry, fiction, and history. Mixing personal stories with research, autobiography, critical theory, family stories, and historical research. Mixing identities, the author being a working class kid, PhD, writer, university administrator, genderqueer bisexual, poet, scholar, and into this mix go the disparate ingredients, and out of this mix comes writing that goes against the grain. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Rennie Christopher. Thank you, Kavitha. Thank you, Candy. So, yeah, I have always been a boundary crosser. Show me a boundary, and my first impulse is to cross it. So, um, I'm going to first talk about the memoir, The Carpenter's Daughter, about my experiences as a first generation college student, which incorporates my own. Um, experience with research from sociology and education. And um, then I'm going to talk about my current project, my novel manuscript, which incorporates family stories, historical research, and my own uh, imagination. So I'm going to start with the dedication of this book. It is for three Richards, Wright, Rodriguez, Christopher. Richard Wright is a name you may recognize. He's most well known for his novel, Native Son. Um, but he also wrote a book, a memoir, called American Hunger. Richard Rodriguez is a writer who was also a first generation college student who wrote a memoir about his experiences called Hunger of Memory. Richard Christopher is my dad. Uh, Richard Christopher is someone whose name would not appear in print if I didn't put it there. He was not a writer himself. He was a carpenter, a work, woodworker, um, a fisherman in his earlier life. And so uh, I was very influenced by Richard Wright, Richard Rodriguez. And when I realized that there are all names were Richards, I wanted to put my dad in that list with these famous writers. And so that's part of the reason for the dedication. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt called Social Class and School Class, where I use 
some framework from sociology to examine my own experience in elementary school. A few years ago, I read an article called Social, <coughs> excuse me, I've had a cold and a persistent cough, so if I cough a few times, please be patient. Um, a few years ago, I read an article called Social Class and the Hidden Curriculum of Work in which educational sociologist Jean Anion describes a study of fifth grade classes in five schools. Two working class, one middle class, one affluent professional, and one executive elite. As I read the article, I wanted to cry. The description of the working class schools matched exactly my own public school education. Quote, in the two working class schools, work is following the steps of a procedure involving rote behavior and very little decision making or choice. The teachers rarely explain why the work is being assigned. Work is often evaluated not according to whether it is right or wrong, but according to whether the children follow the right steps." End quote. The teachers have low expectations of their students. The school trains them for an assembly line, emphasizing discipline, and gives no larger holistic meaning to knowledge. The discipline and teaching follow a paramilitary model, and teachers often say, shut up to their students. This is exactly what my elementary school experience was like, much more like a prison than like a school. Lillian Rubin, another sociologist who I have introduced earlier, also comments about the class structure of schools. Only Rubin notes how the parents contribute to school expectations. Quote, for the working class parents, school is a place where teachers are expected to be tough disciplinarians, where children are expected to behave respectfully and to be punished if they do not and where one mark of that respect is that they are sent to school neatly dressed in their good clothes and expected to stay that way throughout the day. None of these values is highly prized in the professional middle class. For them, schools are expected to be relatively loose, free, and fun, to encourage initiative, innovativeness, creativity, and spontaneity, and to pro provide a place where children will learn social and interpersonal skills. The differences come as no surprise if we understand both the past experience and future expectations of both sets of parents. Most highly educated parents have little fear that their children won't learn to read, write, and do their sums. Why should they? They, they learn them and plenty more. Books, games, toys, I'm oh, sorry, they learn them and learn them well. Their children have every advantage that they had and plenty more. Books, games, toys, all designed to excite curiosity and stimulate imagination. And parents who are skillful in aiding in their use. Working class parents, however, have no such easy assurances about their children's educational prospects. And indeed, my brother's kindergarten teacher said she thought my brother would never learn to read. My parents, very tellingly, blamed the fact that she was a college graduate in psychology for her opinion about my brother. He did learn to read. My parents never gave up their suspicion and distrust of college education psychologists. College educated psychologists, though. My first grade report card has two parts citizenship record and student achievement. The citizenship record is also divided into two parts work habits, and social adjustment. <laughs> the categories under each part are a clear record of what the school was really trying to teach. Conformity, obedience, discipline, subordination to authority. The seven categories under work habits were cooperative, works independently, works quietly, is prompt, follows direction, works steadily, does neat work. There are no categories for is creative, is independently, has fun learning. I have satisfactories or very good and in all the categories in first grade, except for one really very revealing 
needs to improve in one cooperative. <laughs> I'd like to think, I have no memory of it, that that means I defied authority, refused the teacher, didn't follow orders like a good soldier. But I think what it really means is that I didn't go along with the kids. <laughs> Under social adjustment, there were five categories, even more horrifying than the work habits category. Controls emotions, considerate of others, obeys promptly, is polite in speech and action, cares for school property. Once again, I had satisfactory and very good marks in everything except one, controls emotions, in which I had a needs to improve. I must have cried in class to get that mark. How I wish I had needs to improve in three, obeys promptly, and five, cares for school property. But my marks in all the permutations for such categories throughout elementary school were always exemplary. I am ashamed of myself now for having not having rebelled, for having been the perfect little fascist subject. I was always getting citizenship awards and math awards and composition awards because I conformed to adults' expectations. I used how smart I was to please teachers. I was shy, well-behaved, obedient, and I always knew all the answers to everything. Always did my homework, although I didn't really need to. <clears throat> I want to point out that another form of research that I did in that excerpt is going back and looking at my own elementary school report cards, all of which my mother had saved <laughs> and uh, which I was able to go back and, and look at to have some uh, reinforcement to my memory of what my elementary education um, was like. So that excerpt is from the first section of this book. This book is in three sections, and the first is called Hunger, which is a homage to Richard Wright's American Hunger and Richard Rodriguez's Hunger of Memory. You may notice something about my list of three Richards, which is that Richard Wright is African American, Richard Rodriguez is Latino. And uh, so uh, the next section I'm going to read is from section two of the book, which is called <coughs> Fragments from Graduate School. And it is called Fragments from Graduate School because my experience of graduate school was that it really fragmented me. It was only when I was in graduate school that I really came to have a class analysis and an understanding that I came from the working class. And I learned about class through race. And this um, is an example of how I had that learning experience this section is called At a Panel Discussion. And it was a panel that was organized to talk about the experiences of Vietnam veterans. And um, there were four panelists, three of the Vietnam veterans, one of them, a woman who had been married to um, a Vietnam, someone who was in Vietnam. So the panelists are Ruben Gomez, Juan Ramirez, Dan Scripture and Misha Adams. And this was, this was at um, University of California, Santa Cruz. All of the people on this panel are friends of mine, and I attend the session in order to hear them speak. Ruben goes first. He's a big man with wild, bushy hair, but his bigness and physical force are somehow muted into gentleness by the way he uses his hands and by his thick glasses. He talks about being a 24-year-old farm worker, making 25 cents an hour, married and with four kids. So he didn't mind being drafted. He thought it would actually be an improvement. But he also talks about how disillusioned he became and how he became an unlikely peace activist. Juan is a real contrast to Ruben. Juan is small, thin, wiry. He is the kind of guy who really does well as a soldier not the big, hulking, muscle-bound types in the movies. Juan talks about joining the Marines because his high school counselor told him he wasn't college material. 
about how much he hates the heroic way the war is now being portrayed in movies, and how much he's worried there will be another war soon. And there was. Um, <clears throat> Juan is intense and eloquent. He keeps looking at me while he talks. I know he's nervous. It's hard to believe that a man who survived two combat tours in Vietnam could be nervous talking in front of a room full of teenage students, but I understand. I hold his eyes, I smile and nod. Misha is next. She is animated and engaging. She clearly knows how to do this. She has a PhD and has taught and is used to public speaking. She's also conscious of being the only woman on the panel, and she wants to impress the students. She talks about being involved in the beginnings of the women's liberation movement, while her friend, her fiance was in Vietnam, and about what it was like to wait at home, and how in the first women's lib march she was in, uh, that, <coughs> that she was in, the women defiantly called themselves chicks. That gets a laugh. Dan goes last. Whenever he speaks in formal situations, his New England accent comes out, although he's lived almost 20 years in California. He talks about joining the Army as an anti-war college graduate, about how it's the duty of the privileged not to let the underprivileged be the ones to fight the country's wars, that you should give in proportion to what you get. Very Kennedy's Kennedy type stuff, although he doesn't see it that way, and we've argued about that before. As always, I'm torn. Even though Dan is the man I live with, the man I love, and all that, I'm ambivalent about and uneasy with the way he talks. I connect much more easily with Ruben and Juan. I can connect with them through the gut, not just through the head. I want to hold their hands and say, yeah, I know. With Dan, I want to debate. Talk endlessly. He speaks in abstractions, in theories. Juan and Ruben talk about bodies. Dan and Misha come from a different class, a whole different world than I do, or than Ruben and Juan. Neither Dan nor Misha had affluent childhoods, but they both had parents who had college degrees. That makes an enormous difference. 20 years ago, during the war, they were educated. Juan and Ruben weren't. For me, in this group, this discourse, class cuts across race. Dan and Misha and I are all white, and Ruben and Juan are Chicano. But, not, uh, but I nod my head a lot more when Juan speaks than when Dan does. I've known Juan for about two years, although I don't know him well. But ever since I met him, I've felt a kerchunk, something falling into place, recognition. We come from the same place, or the same something. I've slowly started to realize since entering a PhD program at one of the most prestigious universities around, that the same something is class a slippery subject in America, one that's hard to talk about, but somehow it's embodied on that panel. I understand and respect Dan's choice about joining the Army. Sometimes I think if he weren't a Vietnam vet, we couldn't talk to each other at all. But understand and respect are all head stuff. When Juan talks about joining the Marines because otherwise he'd be drafted, the undergraduates in the room all look quite Puzzled. They think the draft was easy to avoid, and it was for their middle class fathers. But I understand in my heart and my gut what Juan's talking about. He's talking about a choice that isn't really a choice. Choice, when he uses it, doesn't mean the same thing it does when Dan uses it. I know that difference. It's inscribed somewhere in my soul. But how do you explain a soul in an academic paper? For that matter, how do you even do it in an autobiography? Why does class bind people together where gender and ethnicity separate? Perhaps it's context, the university. 
one thing I love about the university is that it is, is ground where people can come together across, across vast differences, gender, ethnicity. Here, I can form an alliance with people who were my alien others in my old world, as I was theirs. But that's possible in the university because a generation ahead of me has fought for affirmative action, has fought for ethnic studies, has fought for feminism. Though certainly still more work needs to be done in these issues, it has begun. The discussion is on the table. The discussion about class has not yet been introduced. I just want to point out that I am a member of the group that benefited the most from affirmative action. I love affirmative action. I adore affirmative action because I would not be standing here in front of you if not for affirmative action. White women are the group that benefited the most from affirmative action. And I know for a fact that I was admitted to my graduate school class because they needed to admit more women. So yay me, yay affirmative action. <laughs> Um, so, uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to say about that section um, <coughs> is that uh, it, part of that is an oral history because I'm incorporating stories that other people tell into my own narrative there. My receiving those stories that they told is part of my story, but I'm actually retelling stories that they told. This is a dicey subject. When you're retelling the stories of others, how, what right do you have to those stories? How much of someone else's story can you tell um, when it's in fact part of your own story? Always a, always a touchy question. Um, the third section of this book uh, is after I got through graduate school and I became a college professor. And <clears throat> this section is called Putting Words Together. And it starts with a quote from Bruce Springsteen. Last week, I watched Springsteen on Broadway on Netflix, and that delayed me to the phone <laughs> because of the things that he talks about. Uh, one of the things that he talks about is that he wrote Born and Run and Thunder Road, or he's always writing about getting out, and now he lives 10 minutes from his home town. And that's very much what I feel my own life is like as well. And one of the things that he said that was just so difficult was, when you're young, you always have a blank page. But when you're older, the page isn't blank anymore. I'm still chewing on that. Someday, girl, I don't know when, we're going to get to that place where we really want to go. That's from War to Run. This is a quote from a critic writing about Spring. Mr. Springsteen has gotten more than he wanted, only to discover that a dream fulfilled is no longer a dream. It is a new and heavier weight. Which is part of the way I have felt about my own education. It wasn't an unmixed blessing. I built a bookshelf for a friend. When I go to the lumber yard, I say to the yard guy, I need some one by six pine shelving. And he takes me over to the stack and says, we'll use 14s and I'll, and I say along with him, rip them. Then at the checkout counter, the clerk looks at my bag of nails and I say, 10 penny bright finish. And I feel really good knowing this terminology. While I'm hammering the shelf together, I'm thinking how neat it is to know these words. And I realized, and while it's not true um, that I get a great deal of pleasure out of doing the physical work, I realized that what I really like the best, I'm oh, sorry, I read that one. And while it's true that I get a great deal of pleasure out of doing the physical work, I realized that what I really like best is knowing the words. It's the words that draw me, as with books. 
This is the first glimpse I've ever had of a connection between the two halves of my life. That in both halves of my life, the thing that's drawn me, drawn me is the words more than the actions. The words. 10 D bright finish. D is the abbreviation for penny, the size of the nail. Each term with a particular meaning, part of a code that is the gateway into a separate world, a world that I can enter not just because I know the moves, but because I know the words. Just like the academic world. Maybe there's a bridge, or maybe I just focused on, on the words because I really have left the world of the lumberyard and totally entered into the world of the university. I don't know which it is because I no longer know how to know. So the theme of this last section um, is uh, trying to build those bridges, trying to put the halves of my life, the working class first half and the highly educated second half together. And a very, very strange coincidence happened, which was that I was hired to start a new university in California, which became California State University Channel Islands. But the facility that that university occupies was originally built for a different purpose. It was the Embryo State Mental Hospital. <clears throat> and I have a family connection to it. This section is called Return to the Ancestral Home. So, I've been hired as founding faculty at the newly established California State University campus at Channel Islands. I have returned to Southern California, where I haven't lived since I was 11, but more appropriately, I am in a site where a significant piece of my family history has taken place. <coughs> CSU Channel Islands is a conversion project. It's the old Camarillo State Mental Hospital, which closed down in 1997 and was resurrected in 2002 as a university. It's a beautiful campus of mission revival architecture with lots of trees and green expanses originally built in 1934 by the WPA. The administration likes to emphasize the history of the building of the campus, but it's not as fast as a mental hospital. Nonetheless, many students, faculty, and staff like to say the place is haunted by the ghost of Charlie Parker, uh, Charlie Bird Parker, who spent some time as an inmate and wrote the song, Relaxing at Camarillo. Some people say that if you're in the buildings late at night, you can hear the tune. Camarillo State Mental Hospital is where my grandmother, my mother's mother, was taken in 1936 for electric shock treatment. She wasn't crazy, she was just badly behaved. She was a drunk, and she was an angry drunk. My grandfather left her for another woman, and my grandmother took it very badly. She had bar brawl, bar, bar brawls, that's hard to say. She had bar brawls. Um, she was arrested, but instead of being put in jail, she was sent to the electric chair at Camarillo. So the appropriateness of my coming to this particular university is stunning. Here, my grandmother was subjected to electric shock therapy. And, th and 66 years later, her granddaughter comes to take up a position as a university professor. For me, the hallways are haunted, not just by the ghost of Charlie Parker, but by the ghost of my grandmother. And she's a happy ghost. My grandmother, a high school dropout, was barely literate. She wrote me a note when I was a kid in her scrawling, barely legible handwriting, in which she used the numeral two because she didn't know the difference between T-O, T-W-O, and T-O-O, -O, as she later told me. But, so what? <clears throat> My grandmother could laugh. She was a fat woman, and she had a belly laugh. In my childhood, she was the only person, I think, I ever heard really let go of a laugh. Without her, I might not have really known what laughter sound like. Many people in the years since I've entered the ranks of the genteel intelligentsia have told me that I laughed too loudly. My grandmother would have told me to laugh all the more. 
It's late, and I'm alone in the building, looking at a photo of my grandmother tacked up on my office wall. Out in the hallway, I can hear the ghost of my grandmother dancing with the ghost of Charlie Parker. I want to laugh. If I'm not alone, though, if there's anyone else in the building, they'll think I'm crazy. That's what I feared all my life, that I really was crazy, that I could be put away and spend my life in an institution. Well, I have spent my life in an institution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty grateful at that. And I am finally here, finally sure, really sure, that I am not crazy. So I go ahead and laugh. It comes out very softly. I don't know if Bird and my grandmother dancing out in the hallway can hear me. So I laugh a little bit louder. <laughs> so that is absolutely true. My mother did, my grandmother did undergo um, <coughs> electric shock therapy. It was a very popular thing uh, to do with women in those days. Uh, I've, I've talked to a number of women my age whose mothers and grandmothers had undergone electroshock therapy. It was um, a way to deal with uh, problems that probably were not appropriately dealt with by that methodology. So that's a story about my grandmother, which um, it serves as a bridge into um, the next thing that I want to um, talk, uh, read from, which is um, the novel manuscript. Okay, but before I get there, I'm actually going to start with a, um, a poem about my mom. So there's a um, there's a theater in Los Angeles that's built to look like a Chinese pagoda. It's called Brown's Chinese Theater. That's what's um, being referenced in this poem. <coughs> Catherine Hepburn at Brown's Chinese, 1940. Tall, thin, broad-shouldered, and butch, a sweep of chestnut hair falling elegantly to the padded shoulders of her navy blue suit. The star stands on the red carpet on the white the fans do a double thing. It isn't the famous Hepburn. It's a younger version, a bit taller, not quite as pretty, though equally imposing. The radio announcer, waiting for the real star, pulls my mother aside and holds her in place. When Hepburn walks up the carpet, he will confront her with her double for a joke. The movie is The Philadelphia Story, a screwball comedy about the very rich, about a world which my mother beautician, designer, and seamstress of her own beautiful blue suit imagines but has never really gotten near. That year, at Grandin's Chinese, neither Catherine nor my mother knows a war is coming. Neither knows the lives they will go on to lead. My mother will never enter that country club world she dreams of, will never master Hepburn's classy inflections, though she has the hair, the walk, the demeanor down cold. Fifty years later, I will always see my mother on the screen when I watch those old movies, but I will be the only one. Back in 1940, Catherine makes her way down that red carpet to confront her shadow. She'll smile, extend her hand for a mannish shape, even give my mother a wink, along with an autograph on a 5 by 7 my mother holds out to her. Catherine never notices that the photo is of my mother. <laughs> so mom gets the last laugh there, or almost. After the film, she will hang around the lobby, but on their way home to their quotidian lives, no one will notice her, and the real star will have been secreted out the side door. Mom will return to her own business of illusion, of transforming the ordinary women who visit her shop into Catherine, Betty, Greta and Rita were as close as they can come. So that is absolutely not a true story. <laughs> I completely made that up. But there's a photograph of my mother in which she looks exactly like Catherine Hepburn. And so I imagined that entire scenario. But you know, the end of that poem about her 
transforming the looks of women to try to, for ordinary women to look like movie stars, that transformation um, is uh, what my mother did. What I do is I transform stories. Um, so what I did in this book is I took stories that my mother told about her experiences in California during World War II. My mother was born in 1920, so she was 21 years old when um, Pearl Harbor was bombed in December 1941. And so one of the stories that she used to tell, she had a first husband who was not my father. Um, she, my mother and father weren't married until um, 10 years after the war was over. Um, and my mother was divorced from her first husband. But her first husband was ill and he had thyroid surgery. And they lived in Los Angeles and they went out while her, her first husband was recuperating. They went out and stayed on his brother's farm in the Imperial Valley. Um, and so that part is all true. In my version of the story, the character based on my mother has an affair with uh, uh, somebody from the neighboring farm. Not true, I made that part up. Mm -hmm. um, then my mother told these other stories, which for a long time I didn't believe. And her, her mother was divorced at that point, my grandmother who had the electric shock, the shock therapy. And she had you know, various boyfriends over the years, but she had a boyfriend who had a farm out in the valley. And um, the story my mother told was that he took over the farms on either side of him, his two neighbors' farms, because they were Japanese American when they were interned. And when they came back, when the neighbors came back, he gave them their farms back. Now, I, I, I believe that that may indeed have been a true story, because there has been more historical research recently about some white resistance to the internment of Japanese Americans. It was not widespread, but it did exist. So perhaps um, that was a true story. Um, and that is part of the novel as well. The novel takes place in two time periods. <coughs> one is 1941, uh, and the other is 1999. The main character of the 1999 section is me, if I had no good qualities. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not. I mean, it's not that the that the main character has no no good qualities, but she has absolutely no good qual qualities when it comes to romantic relationships. Um, and uh, she is the daughter of the main character of the 1941 section, and it kicks off. The book kicks off with her at her mother's funeral, and she discovers that her mother had a secret. And then she goes and tries to find out what that secret is. She's a documentary filmmaker, and so she, on the premise of making a documentary film about his mother, her mother goes and does some exploration uh, <coughs> about what might have really happened. So the first excerpt I'm gonna read is from one of the 1999 sections. Um, and it's not long after, and, um, one of the reasons that you can tell that the main character is uh, me is because she has my middle name. Um, her name is Terry, and my middle name is Teresa. Um, so it's not long after her, her mother has died, and um, she's found this evidence that her mother has a secret, and uh, one of the pieces of evidence is a Japanese fan that she found in a box in her mother's stuff. And she is, She's, a, like I said, a documentary filmmaker who is making a documentary on women astronauts. I did so much research on women astronauts, I practically made the documentary in prose <laughs> in the book. This is a conversation between her and her lover, who she lives with. And I think everything else is self explanatory the, the lover's name is Celine. Invisibility was an issue between Celine and me. While I wasn't exactly in the closet, except with my family, I wasn't out enough 
for her. I just didn't like to make an issue out of being gay. Same as I didn't like to make an issue out of being a woman or a filmmaker or a woman filmmaker or out of anything, really. Celine said it was because I liked to hide behind the camera, that I was a voyeur who liked to watch other people, but I didn't like to be watched myself. Skipping a bit. I finished the film the day before the deadline. I didn't want to call it finished. I never did with any film because I felt like there were always still improvements I could make. But this one, it was just one that I didn't want to let go. I heard that Ken Burns kept a bell in his editing room and rang it ceremoniously as each reel of film was locked. I sometimes thought I should develop some kind of ritual like that, but I never had. I thought this would be my favorite filmmaking experience, that nothing else would ever be as much fun, be as much exactly the film I wanted to make, and I didn't want it to end. It had to, though. Everything had to end. Each space flight returned to Earth. The night I finished, Celine and I had a little celebration. Um, <coughs> after our celebration, Celine sat at the table with her usual pile of books and papers and her laptop. I sat on the couch reading a history of women in aviation. It was way too late to be doing background research for the documentary, but I was just sort of stuck on the subject. After a while, Celine came over and sat beside me, put her head on my shoulder and looked at the page I was looking at, a photo of aviation pioneer Jackie Cochran in her military uniform. Celine didn't say anything unusual for her. In the silence, I started talking almost at random, surprising myself by bringing up my mother. My dad told me the strangest thing. He told me mom wanted to be a pilot during the war to ferry airplanes over to England. They had women doing that so the male pilots could fly combat missions. There's something about it here in this book. I've never known about it before, and I never knew my mother learned to fly. Did she get to fly? No, something happened and she never did it. What happened? I don't know, Dad didn't say. And you didn't ask? I was so surprised by finding out that my mother had wanted to be a pilot. That was all I could think about. I wish I'd learned to fly. You're af afraid of flying. No, I'm not. She put her hand flat on my chest, over my heart, and got that intense look that always made me want to squirm away. You're afraid of risking anything. Why didn't you ever come out to your mother? What? She knew, you know. She knew all along. Why do you think that? Because she told me. And now I felt like I must have drunk too much champagne and couldn't follow the conversation properly. She told me what? About six months ago, when she and your dad came to visit you, your mother and I were in the kitchen washing the dishes, and you and your dad were off somewhere else. And she was running on, telling some story like she always did. And then suddenly she looked me square in the face and said, Celine, I really want to know, and it's okay with me if the answer is yes. Are you and Terry lesbians? I just about dropped a plate since given that what you'd always said about your mother, I thought she had no idea. I was too stunned to say anything. Celine went on while I just sat there with my mouth hanging open. I didn't quite know what to say, so I just told her the truth. I just said yes. And she told me that ever since you were a little girl, she'd known there was something different about you. She said she knew because you hadn't had a boyfriend since high school, and she was pretty sure your high school boyfriend was gay and that you two just hung out together as camouflage. <laughs> Wait, my mother said that? She knew about that? <laughs> this was my mother you were talking to? Really? I can't imagine her having that conversation with you. Honey, she said more than that. She said when you were in college, you never told her about any of your friends at all. And she said she always knew you weren't a loner and that you'd find people to get along with as soon as you got away from Dinuba. And she was glad you did. She didn't want you to be alone. I remember exactly what she said. I didn't want Terry to never love anybody. And if it's a woman she loves, well, okay then. She said, I don't want you and my daughter to be afraid of what you have with each other. There's no way she said all that. You're making it up to try to make me feel better somehow. That's somebody else you're talking about. I stopped. Yes, exactly. It was somebody other than the mother I knew. Somebody romantic and wistful. Somebody who kept a Japanese fan hidden away for 50 years.
Celine ignored my protest. I asked her what your father thought, and she said she hadn't talked with him about it. But now that she knew for sure, she'd work on him a while getting ready for it. Why didn't you ever tell me? I was hoping she'd tell you herself, or that you'd come out to her and discover she already knew, and it'd be a big relief. If that didn't happen, eventually I'd have told you. I didn't think she was going to die so soon. I thought the two of you would have time to work it out with each other. I told Celine I needed to digest all this and didn't want to talk about it anymore, and she didn't push it. Later that night, I lay awake while Celine slept beside me. I was often awake late into the nights. It was a pattern that had been growing over the past few years. I was afraid I was inheriting my mother's insomnia. She'd always been up late at night, often reading. She read romance novels, which I thought was incongruous because it seemed to me there wasn't a romantic bone in her body. She scoffed at romantic movies and such. But she said she liked to read about the exotic places where the novels were set, places she would never get to go. This next section is from the 1941 section, the character very loosely based on my mother's name, Lily. Um, I did a lot of research for the 1941 sections, including a lot of archival research online, hallelujah for that, in the Los Angeles Times. At the time, I was living in Southern California, and the Los Angeles Times was the daily paper that I read. So I saw their masthead every day. That's how I got my news, LA Times mastheads. Going back and looking at this stuff in 1941 was absolutely shocking, because nothing that was written about the Japanese was anything that I hadn't seen in secondary sources, but seeing it there live, so to speak, on the masthead of the daily newspaper I read every day was super shocking. So Lily is having this adulterous affair with somebody from the farm uh, next door whose name is Howard. He's named after a childhood friend of mine. Howard is Nisei, second generation Japanese American. Um, and um, they, uh, December 9th, 1941, they're in Los Angeles, and they are at the house of a friend of Lily's, whose name is Betty. All three names are going to appear here. Betty's husband is a sailor on the Arizona. Okay, no internet, no TV, nobody had any idea what had actually happened at Pearl Harbor. When Lily woke up in the morning, Betty was already gone. She went down to the corner and bought the newspaper, then came back and cooked breakfast. Howard had turned on the radio. There was a report that enemy planes had flown over San Jose and San Francisco. Mrs. Roosevelt and Mayor LaGuardia had come to California on behalf of the Office of Civilian Defense and met with Governor Olson in Sacramento to give advice on how to prepare for an attack. I'm not saying what to do if an attack comes. I'm putting it when an attack comes, Mayor LaGuardia said. Do you think there'll be an invasion, Lily asked. No, I don't think so. Japan is a really long way away. It'd be hard for them to get here with enough forces for an invasion. They invaded places in Asia much closer to home. They didn't invade Hawaii, they just bombed it. I don't think they'll invade here. They didn't invade Hawaii yet. I think if they could have invaded, they would have by now. Or they bypassed Hawaii and are coming here. <coughs> then bombing Hawaii was a bad strategy because now we're on alert. How can you be so calm? It just couldn't happen here. Not like Poland or France. Lily thought about that. About how foreign and different Poland and France and all of Europe, even London, looked in the newsreels. The more she thought about it, it was impossible to imagine enemy armies marching through the streets of Los Angeles the way the Nazis had marched through Paris. Skipping a bit. Howard took the parts of the paper Lily set aside, continuing to look for articles about the arrests of Japanese Americans. It says they're continuing to round up both men and women. They're taking the ones they've arrested from the county jail out to Terminal Island. My God, Lily said, they're arresting women? The Army's guarding Terminal Island and the fishing fleet. The fishing fleet? They think the fishing boats are going to torpedo us? They keep talking about finding weapons at the houses of people they're arresting, as if that meant that people were dangerous, 
or spies or something. We have a couple of rifles at our house. We use them to shoot rattlesnakes. Johnny's family has a gun rack. They have three rifles and two shotguns. My dad has a pistol, a 45. That's not so unusual. I guess it's only unusual if you're Japanese. Are you worried about your parents? Yeah, of course, they're Issei. They're not citizens. They're the people the paper keeps calling aliens. Well, Lily said, here's an article where the Church Federation of Los Angeles praises the government for, quote, preventing acts of discrimination or violence towards residents of alien descent whose government is at war with the United States. Lily handed him the section. He looked at it and read, and then it says, quote, we urge upon all people that in their dealings with these citizens and strangers within our gates, they display those Christian qualities which will make easier the task of the government officials in this difficult time. What does he mean, strangers within our gates? My parents have been here since 1918. They're not strangers. And look at the bottom of the page. It says that in Seattle, Chinese people are going to carry identification cards so they won't be mistaken for Japanese, quote, to avoid any unpleasantness. What sort of unpleasantness do you think they're trying to avoid? Getting arrested? He flipped through those pages to another article. They shut down Little Tokyo completely. They shut down Sumitomo Bank and the Japan Cal Cal California Daily News. My dad reads that paper. They shut down all the bars in Little Tokyo, too. He turned another page. And look at this. They closed the borders to all Japanese, citizen or alien. How can they close the borders to citizens? Does that mean I can't even go down to Mexicali? Are they afraid I'll try to get to Japan to enlist in the Japanese army? I'm an American. Lily did not read, read aloud to Howard what she found in an opinion column, where the columnist wrote, if Hitler executes 100 civilian hostages selected at random for the murder of one German officer in a conquered country, the United States could raise him 100 victims selected out of the concentration camps were the numbers of anti-American Bund and many alien Japanese and fascist Italians will be quartered. Even though Howard was a citizen, not an alien like his parents, she looked at him at his movie star good looks and imagined him being put up against a wall and shot and felt sick to her stomach. That night, Lily and Howard lay together in a real bed for the first time. We could run away, Lily said. I can get a divorce. If we run away, he can divorce me for adultery or desertion. Then you and I can get married. If we were married, then you'd be safe, right? We can't get married in California. It isn't legal for whites to marry Japanese. Oh, I didn't know that. OK, then we'll go somewhere else. We'll go to Arizona. It's not legal there either, or Nevada, or Oregon. The only place that's legal for whites and Japanese to marry is Washington State. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay then, we'll go to Seattle. I was there once with my mother, boat racing. Nice town, we'll go there. We'll go to Canada if we have to. The borders are close to Japanese, remember? We can't go to Canada. They both knew they were only daydreaming. Neither of them had any money. And even if Lily could get Johnny to file for divorce, it would be months before it could be granted, months before she and Howard could travel to Seattle. And who knew what the situation would be then, whether they'd be able to travel there, whether it would still be legal for them to get married in Washington. Lily felt the world was closing in. She thought maybe it was like being in Paris or Warsaw after all, only the problem wasn't an invasion. Um, so, that story doesn't quite happen. But the parallel between the two sections of, of the book is they're, they're both relationships that at the time and in circumstances are socially forbidden. In 1999, same-sex marriage was not legal. In 1941, interracial marriage was not legal. Anybody know what year interracial marriage was finally made legal in all 50 states? Sue, you so, know. I think so. Is it 68? Yes, that is right. That is right. And until 1968, interracial marriage was not legal. 
mind blowing, isn't it? Um, okay, so I'm going to close with a couple of poems which focus on gender, which is one of my boundaries that I cross. Um, in this poem, there are two artists mentioned. One is Robert Mapplethorpe, who is famous for his photographs of men engaged in S&M practices, um, which are very transgressive. Many of his photographs are of black men and white men together. Big controversial stuff. But also, Mapplethorpe photographed flowers. He has all these photographs, beautiful photographs of flowers. <coughs> the other um, artist who's mentioned is Georgia O'Keeffe, who's best known for her paintings of flowers. But Georgia O'Keeffe also painted modernist cityscapes and uh, bleached bones in the desert. This is called performance art. If I were rich, I'd buy a Mapplethorpe print and hang it on my wall. Not one of the ones you might expect me to choose just to shock everybody. An image of transgression, of leather, or S&M, or male-on-male -male miscegenation. No, I'd choose one of his flowers. Those silent, formal shapes, so still, so strange. And then I'd buy a Georgia O'Keeffe painting of an orchid, one of those flowing anemones of petals about to leap off the canvas and into your face. And I'd hang it on another wall. And I'd say to visitors, like a gallery docent, between these walls somewhere, that's where I am. That's who I am. See if you can find me. Then I'm going to end with this poem, which makes reference, again, to laws that used to actually exist, which I am overjoyed to tell you don't exist anymore. <laughs> this is called So Arrest Me. In the old days, in the bars, the butches could be arrested if they weren't wearing three pieces of women's clothing. What exactly is women's clothing, anyway? frilly panties, a push-up bra to make your little boobs look bigger, a skirt. In Gage's play, The Second Coming of Joan of Arc, Joan is ordered by the judge at her trial to abandon men's clothes. Back in her cell, in a dress, she's raped by the guards. In the Bush Femme Test, the question is, do you feel more powerful in a skirt or in pants. In a skirt, I feel like a little girl playing dress up in her mother's clothes. No, I feel like a gay man in drag who might be arrested, thrown in a cell, beaten up, and raped. I feel like Joan of Arc stripped of her power before she's burned. So go ahead and arrest me, because I'm not wearing three pieces of women's clothing. I'm wearing shoes I can run in, pants I can stand and fight in, and a shirt that conceals my true heart, just like every man. Thanks.